This cigarette factory was once operated by an investment group consisting of two Americans and a Haitian. It was therefore not strictly American-owned. Originally, the plant manufactured a brand of cigarette called Banda, and not Creole, the current product. According to one of the former partners, the factory was seized in 1963, some two years after it opened, and was turned over to Colonel Claude Ramon, the head of the palace guard and a cousin of President Duvalier. The factory was worth about $400,000 at the time, but its value has since dropped to about half that amount. When asked who owns the plant now, the manager told us a corporation, and he refused to name officers when directly questioned about it. Another American investment which isn't doing too well in Haiti is the Power and Light Company. Smaller than the Homestead, Florida municipal plant, which supplies electricity to 15,000 customers in South Dade, the Haitian firm feeds power to the entire city of Port-au-Prince, with a population of about 400,000. The operation is pitifully inadequate, and until new generators can be installed, current is rationed in various parts of the city during the day. The government, until late last year, had never paid a cent of its past due electric bills. It owed the company $2,165,000. When the settling up finally came, it was in the form of bonds and notes, no cash. It can be said that stealing electricity is perhaps the most important scientific achievement in Haiti since Independence Day in 1804. Last year alone, the firm lost 60% of its total output to thieves. The people use Cumberland devices to slow down meters, and more directly, they simply tap the power lines with wires leading into their homes and bypass the meters completely. Over the past three months, seven persons have died by electrocution. The power company is forever rounding up the Maverick wiretaps and to date has disconnected 14,000 illegally lit homes. One of the most ingenious schemes was perpetrated by a Haitian who ran a heavy-duty wire off the power line through a makeshift panel in his home and hooked up a feeder line to a barbed wire fence. He then charged 50 cents a month to his customers along the fence. The most elaborate wiretapping system of all belongs to the gambling casino in Port-au-Prince. It was allegedly installed after the operators received an overdue bill for $6,000. The network of all-weather underground cable strings out for 300 feet. The power company is apparently without power to do anything about it. The casino contributes substantially to Haiti's economy through taxes, and business is usually good. Another big source of government income is the national lottery. Tickets sold everywhere could bring a lucky winner as much as $20,000. The government gets 5%. Drawings are held every 15 days, and they closely resemble Cuban bolita, except that in Haiti it's called bolet. Numbered wooden balls are placed in a large tumbler, are mixed thoroughly, and the first one drawn is worth the most. In addition to the jackpot, smaller prizes are awarded. The lottery and the casino are both run on the up and up. Haiti gets help from outside sources. While the United States no longer sends money to the nation, it does contribute funds and personnel to a malaria control program, said to be the largest such project in the world. UNICEF, CARE, the United Nations, and the Pan American Health Organization are also greatly involved. The work consists mainly of dispatching men into the country, take blood tests from the natives, and issue them malaria-depressive drugs in pill form. Some Haitians object. Most are familiar with the procedure and offer no resistance. DDT is sprayed on homes and vehicles, but this method by itself has not proven effective. Before the malaria campaign began, epidemics in Haiti were an annual occurrence. Various agencies also help out. This film shows the Salvation Army at work. What might just as well have depicted the Catholic and Protestant Charities or International Rescue Committee? It's a lunch program for school age and preschool youngsters, the only substantial food they receive all day. The canteen is closed on weekends, 
and the line is always longer on Monday than it is at any other time during the week. Haitians are proud people. They don't like handouts. The Salvation Army charges parents four cents for a total of five meals. Education in Haiti is free and, in theory, compulsory. But only two out of seven school-aged children actually attend school. The illiteracy rate is declining from 90% 10 years ago to 80% today. There seem to be more than enough schools in Haiti. That's not the problem. It's just that each child is a potential worker and breadwinner, and the average Haitian is more inclined to worry about his stomach than about his brain. Those who do get educated find the system inadequate. There are no postgraduate courses. Upon completion of studies at any one of Haiti's eight universities, the student feels there is much more to be learned. It is not uncommon for the best minds in Haiti to leave the country in search of better educational opportunities. Once exposed to the life in Europe, Africa, or the United States, few of them desire to return home. We first saw President Duvalier at a palace reception for Panamanian Ambassador Jorge Morales. The occasion was a formal one, the presentation of credentials. Papa Doc waited with the heads of his palace guard behind him, his ten cabinet members and seven undersecretaries lining both sides of the reception room. President Duvalier was born in Port-au-Prince on April 14, 1907. His political career began in 1946, when, as a medical doctor, he was named director of Haiti's National Public Health Service. Part of his professional training had come at the University of Michigan. He became president in 1957, and seven years later had himself declared president for life. Duvalier neither drinks nor smokes and prefers that neither activity be performed in his presence. He is partial to dark clothing. The president is believed to have diabetes and heart disease, but he himself has never publicly confirmed this. Our interview with the ruler of Haiti in one minute. President Duvalier does not like to grant personal interviews, nor does he particularly relish the thought of speaking in English to visiting newsmen. English is his second language. He expresses himself far better in French. However, the president recognizes that his country needs help and that its image needs repair. What will follow is one of the rare instances in which President Duvalier has consented not only to express his thoughts in English, but to allow his words to be recorded for presentation to an American audience. And as a television first, Channel 4 uses videotape equipment to give the interview the quality of a live pickup. President Duvalier, let me say at the outset, we appreciate your taking time to give us this interview. I know you haven't granted very many in recent years to American newsmen. We do appreciate the opportunity. Let me ask you, first of all, what do you consider Haiti's role in the world to be today? By that I mean, are you aligned with the African states, those emerging countries? Uh, do you primarily consider yourself a nation in the Western Hemisphere? Just where does Haiti sit? From the historical point of view, we belong to Africa. It was a, we are here as a, by the, and I can call that a, a geo, geo, geographical accident. We are in, Am in America because uh, before the Independence Day, most of the men from the Was go, were going to be the Haitian, come from Africa. 